Now good? Yep. Everything is up. So, uh, Mike, would you like to share a few words about the agenda? Uh, for sure. So, hello from uh, me as well, and welcome. Um, in this webinar, we'll be covering, uh, we'll be starting with uh, why uh, you need to localize uh, your software application. And then uh, we're going to share a few notes about how you can get started with localization, some concepts and some questions that you, you will need to answer, and a brief terms and methodology regarding localization. And then we'll jump into some very characteristic localization workflows and ways that uh, you can implement uh, localization. And uh, we will end the presentation with uh, how you can monitor the progress and check the return of your investment. So starting off with uh, why should you care about localization and what are the benefits that your business will get. Uh, here we have some data from uh, that we covered uh, in the wild. Uh, Panayoti, can we move to the next slide? All right, so I won't be reading the data. I will just share the, the outline. Um, these are numbers that uh, reflect uh, essentially trust that people put in uh, content presented in their native languages. Uh, this is based on a research that uh, CSA Research has done in uh, 2020. Um, again, because those last two years were very uh, uh, affected very much the digital services, the numbers and uh, the impact that localization can have today compared to 2020, it's much, much bigger. So in essence, what we see here is that people uh, want to uh, consume content in their native language, and they tend to trust services that offer content in their native languages, either to make purchase or to spend most of their time on those services. And uh, now uh, let's move into, uh, to Ryan on choosing what and where to localize. Hello. Okay. So one of the first things that we hear people say a lot is, okay, I'm ready to start my localization journey, to which we ask, what content and language is are you planning to start with? So regarding the content, both times we people see using the similar types of content, it's help slash support docs, product descriptions, marketing material, legal documents, internal documents, maybe a simple website or mobile apps. Uh, a good idea is to just look for, at the content from your main revenue stream, right? You want to follow the money. What is the marketing potential of this content? Uh, another good thing you can do is to check your competitors. That's usually a good indicator of where to begin. Uh, another uh, option we see people following is to subscribe to the 80-20 rule, meaning that 80% of users look at 20% of content. So whatever that content is, it's probably a good place to get started as well. And now the next thing after deciding kind of what kind of content to begin with is deciding what languages to translate into. Um, in general, as we shared, people prefer to interact in their native language. Right, so you want to check your existing markets, what languages are being used there, or maybe you're trying to enter a new market. So what is the predominant, predominant language or languages in that market? You know, some analytics can help figure out what languages to start with. And then after you've selected the content and languages to translate, you'll need to decide who will perform those translations. Um, so just in general, about the, some languages that we see most common that are revenue generating, there's a, you know, if you Google it, you'll see a big list out there. Some of the common ones are French, Spanish, German, Italian, Japanese, and so forth. But again, look at your, your, your data and uh, make a decision on where you can think it have the best impact. All right. And now uh, I'll be sharing some uh, info. No, Panayoti, go to the previous slide. One thing that we usually, based on our experience, we see uh, people neglect uh, paying attention to is who will actually do the translations. Um, there is a common misconception that when we're saying localization industry, 
we mean translation. We mean that all the tools provided uh, offer translations. For example, our service, Transfix, is, is often considered as a translation service, which is not. Uh, for the moment, I'll avoid entering that loophole of what Transfix is offering, and I will uh, continue with uh, choosing the, the correct people that can do your translations. Based on our experience, what we have seen working is uh, if you have a community that, that is already using your service, uh, which is globally distributed around the world uh, in various countries, then you can utilize your community into making these translations. Some examples of uh, our customers that are doing that is Waze and uh, Scratch from MIT, which uh, use the translations into providing their uh, use their uh, communities to provide the translations. Uh, the most common uh, case that we see after that is vendors or translation agencies. Those are professionals, professional translators tailored to your needs. So uh, the, the usual way that translation vendor works is they are assigned uh, a work. You assign them uh, uh, some content that needs translation and uh, they come back with uh, this content translated to the languages you uh, wanted to translate to. Uh, usually charging in uh, translation vendors happens with uh, word counts, which means, uh, for example, when we have the phrase, hello world, this contains two words. And if we're translating this phrase into French, it will cost you about 15 to 18 cents per word. While translating this phrase in Spanish will cost you around 9 to 12 cents per, per word. So the translation vendor has a price that uh, uh, reflects to the word count and the target languages that we're talking about. Uh, going past that, uh, another example that we have seen uh, usually is using your own network. So there are uh, companies that uh, use our services, for example, that... Uh, have employees or uh, know uh, a close or know in the closed network people that are bilingual or speak more than one languages, and they choose to use uh, uh, this uh, network to make their first translations. Uh, this has the benefit that uh, you can see all the other aspects that uh, uh, relate to localization and uh, evaluate how you're doing on those aspects before investing more in actual translation. And uh, finally, one service that uh, it grows bigger with uh, time is machine translation, like uh, Google Translate, DeepL, etc. cetera. Uh, just clarification, when we say machine translation today, we always mean AI assisted. That means that the translation you get today uh, might be different than the translation you will get tomorrow just because the system is trained better. And again, based on our experience, what we see is that in the latest years, people are trusting more machine translation and we see this becoming a trend. Uh, so passing it on to Ryan now. Thank you. So a couple of terms that you're going to come across pretty quickly when starting your localization are I-18N and L-10N. So let's talk a little bit about those. Uh, the next slide, uh, internationalization is, of course, uh, it's known as I-18N. And of course, it's uh, because of the letter I plus 18 characters plus an N on the end. I'll pause to give everybody a chance to count the characters. Okay, so uh, internationalization is everything that you have to adjust in terms of software and design to prepare your website or app for a global launch. So what does that really mean? Well, for a software developer, I18N means designing a localizable user interface and abstracting all localizable elements. Uh, for example, the same words and sentences in different languages may have different lengths, so if you don't adjust the design of your website accordingly, then some translations may end up breaking it. So think responsive design here. Uh, also, you need to think about the locale-specific data like date, time, and currency formats. These need to ch be changed depending on things like the market, culture, and personal preferences. So basically, internationalization uh, must happen before any localization can occur. And now we'll talk a little bit about localization. 
localization or L10N. I think we get the pattern for that now. Uh, it's the, def the definition of localization is when you take a piece of content in its original form and then convert it into something more suitable for another culture. So it's all about making your content accessible and appealing to locals. Uh, in many cases, localization will require modifications to other usable, visible components of software, such as images. If images contain text that is not also localized, it can look disjointed, so to speak. So uh, you may be wondering, how do you localize images? Uh, and the answer is to have images for each target language in your app or website points to the correct image for the language that is selected by the user. Uh, and last, don't forget cultural adoption here. So not everybody celebrates New Year's on January 1st. So you know, you're not gonna wanna wish your users in China a happy new year on January 1st. It will look strange. So basically to sum up uh, internationalization and localization, internationalization is the foundation that localization is built on. And one last thing, internationalization must be done by you. So after internationalization is done, then you can move on to localization. Uh, a big part of that is translations. That can be done by a third party slash vendor if you wish, but it still must be managed by you. So uh, Mike, you wanna talk about what comes next? Sure. So now that we get a sense of, of what internationalization and localization mean, let's see some options that uh, you can apply on your use case. Um, this is what we call methods of localization, and it's the way that all the internationalization work that you must do will be made available. Uh, how, how you can apply internationalization on your software application. Uh, like the title says up here, there are two ways to do that. There is the traditional way, way, which is broadly used for many years. It's established and widely supported. And there is a new way, which is leveraged, leveraging most of the modern way of developing an application and extending its usage. So let's deep dive in uh, a bit. So starting off with a traditional way, uh, what we see here is a, a graph representing the most complex uh, uh, content you can localize, which is an application. So you, starting from the top, uh, you start internationalization in your code that will essentially produce a file containing all the content that you can localize. And then you feed that content into a localization uh, method uh, either the, a translation memory system like uh, Transfixes or a vendor that can handle translations. And what you get out of that is a set of files uh, for each language you're going to uh, localize, which then you will need to feed to your application. Um, so uh, that's, that's the traditional way. Uh, we can move on to the next one and I can highlight the differences on the next slide. Uh, so this is the modern way of localization, um, a new way of localization. Uh, what we see here is a, a service that we offer called Transfix Native. Uh, taking the same example of the application, you can see here that there are no files included. So uh, you can send uh, the exact content that you want to localize uh, directly to Transfix with no files included there. Uh, Transfix can handle localization of, it, of that and feed another service, which we see here as common delivery service. This is uh, an online service, and that service will feed translations to your application. Uh, what uh, this uh, workflow offers is uh, you're getting away with files. So you, need, you completely forget about spreadsheets and Excel holding your content and the translations, and translations happen on the fly and uh, feed, sorry, feed your application with new updates constantly. So there is no blockage in uh, how content is flowing in for, tran for tran localization and how localized content is fed to your application. So that's it. And moving it on to uh, you, uh, Ryan. Okay, thank you. So now, once you've figured out kind of what content and languages you want to begin your localization journey with, and you know the difference between I18N and L10N, 
and have thought a little bit about how you'd like to localize ideally, then you can decide on the best fit for your use case. So below we've outlined four different use cases that we see most common, but it's certainly not the only way to do things. This is just to, to give you an idea of, of where you can begin. So the first use case we have here uh, is where you don't really have a localization team per se, you know, more reacting to business needs rather than being proactive about it. And uh, so the first thing, of course, you're going to need to do is internationalize. That always comes first using either the traditional or the new way shared above. And then we're going to use machine translation to uh, translate your content, which is the, the quickest, easiest way to do it. And so after all of the machine translation is done, then you can release that uh, localized content and you know, most likely rely on user reported issues to fix translations because you're probably not going to be doing too much uh, looking at reporting at this stage. Uh, Mike, did you have any comments about this first method, first use case? Uh, yeah. Uh, what I wanted to add here is that based on uh, our experience, we see uh, some of our customers choosing this workflow when they don't have uh, sensitive content that they want to localize. So they use the, this workflow when they are localizing an, uh, an internal application that is distributed uh, around the world. And uh, they have uh, people around the world that report issues that they can jump in and uh, fix those issues. So a suggestion here is that if you have something that is public, public facing and a lot of people uh, are viewing that uh, content, it's not safe to use this work, workflow. But if you're having something that uh, a selected few people uh, look into, then this workflow works, uh, works better and it requires low maintenance from your side. Right. Yeah. No, I guess one last point here is you want to make sure to pick your machine translation service carefully. Of course, there's a lot of them out there. Some of them work better and for some languages and some markets than others. So, uh, you know, you want to do your research and pick that carefully. We can offer some advice if you'd like. And moving on to the another use case that we see frequently. Again, of course, we're going to have to internationalize. I'm sorry, Mark, are you going to talk about this slide? Yeah, yep, yeah, sure. Okay. So this is uh, a bit more heavy on uh, on your side to, to maintain and it's using a translation agency to some uh, steps of, uh, of the process. Uh, it goes, uh, it starts with the same way as the previous uh, workflow we've seen and you need to internationalize your content using the same machine translation to, tra to automatically translate your content and uh, we're introducing another service here called translation memory that uh, will be used to autofill similar content that is introduced with updates. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit later. And uh, at step number four, um, you, uh, you can use a translation agency, a vendor, to review translations from machine translation and proactively fix any weird translations that uh, are up there. Uh, and uh, then proceed with uh, releasing your content and use, for, this is the, the step that requires more effort on, uh, on your side, use reporting to validate cost and cross check with a vendor and proceed with uh, the required payments. Uh, the good thing about this workflow is that um, the process that uh, the translation uh, agency goes to to fix uh, weird translations is called editing and usually costs less than uh, producing a, a new translation from scratch. Uh, Ryan, do you have anything to add here? Uh, just, I guess, based on our experience, uh, along with machine translation, you're going to want to make sure to pick your translation agency carefully. Some of them have better quality than others. You know, of course, price comes into play as well. So uh, maybe a, you know, a, a, a translation agency with a lower price point could uh, work well for you, but if you want more higher quality, then you're going to want to pick a, a translation agency that uh, is known for having a little bit of uh, better quality in their work. So, and again, we can provide the guidance on that if you need to, if you would like. 
And then I guess we'll move on to the third use case here. And again, of course, we're going to internationalize. And this use case gets rid of machine translation. So again, this is going to go be for, for higher quality. Um, and you're going to also enable translation memory to autofill new content based on previous translations. So you use the translation memory first, and then use machine translation after to fill in whatever is not already done by machine translation. Uh, and now you're going to want to be much more proactive with translations, with that translation agency. So, you know, whatever TM doesn't do or, or uh, I'm sorry. So we're not going to use machine translation for this one. As I said, we're going to use translation memory to fill in the content. And then without using machine translation, you're going to hire a translation agency for higher quality in order to, uh, you know, for them to fix any errors with anything that may be wrong with your TM and to provide translations and review new translations. Um, humans are still better at making translations than machines are. So, uh, you know, at some point in the future when you're moving on to other content and things that are a little bit more important, you're gonna to wanna to move away from that machine translation and get to that translation agency. Mike, did you have anything you wanted to point out here? Uh, yeah, I wanted to point out that this is the most common workflow that uh, we see in uh, Transfix. And uh, we see the bigger companies, companies that are mature with localization, tend to work closer to this kind of workflow. So they have uh, a dedicated uh, vendor or uh, some vendors that work better on specific languages, like Ryan said before, they share their content for localization to those vendors and they proceed with the release cycles uh, like so. Uh, so that's it from, uh, from my side. Ryan, do you have anything to, to add here? Uh, no, I think we're covered on this one. All right. And uh, now we're moving on to the last uh, localization workflow that we'll be presenting. This is a bit different than uh, the previous ones and it's using uh, your community and uh, your network. So essentially the first step is the same. Again, we're not using a machine translation service over here. We're using translation memory again to autofill content. This saves a lot of time. And then we use a community or uh, our own network. Sorry. Panagetti? Sorry for this slide. I lost the slide, sorry. Sorry for this. All right. Yeah. Uh, like I was saying, um, you invite your community into the service and your network to translate your content. Uh, there are various options there to use uh, your community and your people better. One of the options include uh, uh, voting for the best translation for a phrase. Um, other things that are important in this, uh, in this case is uh, the point number five uh, that we see in the workflow. Um, you need to stay close to your community and cater that community into localization. Um, Ryan can share some more in here. Uh, so Ryan, passing it to you to share uh -huh. some more insights. Yeah. It's about this last one, I guess. You want to make sure that your contributors feel valued. You can do things like using a leaderboard, meaning somewhere where you recognize people for their effort. You know, these volunteers or your network are, you know, they're not getting paid for the most part. So you want to do something just to recognize their effort and contributions. Yeah, that's true. Okay, um, we can move on to the next slide. All right, now that uh, you have a good uh, idea of what localization workflows are, we can pass to some more uh, questions that need answer. And uh, they have to do uh, with handling the implementation of each workflow. Uh, what we'll see here uh, apply to all the, the localization workflows we've seen before and require an answer from your side. So let's uh, dive a deep deeper here. All right, so the first thing that you need to do is to get ready for localization. That's the internationalization step. 
past choosing uh, going the traditional way with files or going with uh, a more uh, uh, modern way with over there delivery. There are other aspects that uh, you will need to check. Uh, you will need to check uh, whether you can apply some automations to get that content and feed it to your localization services, whether there are integrations that you can apply. Uh, for example, if uh, you're using GitHub, there might be an integration available to feed uh, the content directly to your localization service. Or if you're using um, a Zendesk, for example, for your help sender, you can use that to, again, grab that content directly from Zendesk and feed it to uh, your localization services. Um, and another point here is uh, context and information to the localization team. Uh, so once uh, your content uh, enters localization, the localization team has access to that, you will need to figure out uh, what other context, what other metadata are available for that team to, to do their work uh, uh, at best. Uh, for example, uh, if there is a word, let's say home or Apple, uh, the localization team will need to have context, whether you're referring to a house or the, the starting page, or uh, is Apple uh, the fruit or is Apple the company? Uh, what, are, what, are, what other strings are in and around that uh, string? Uh, so you will need to figure that out and be able to feed uh, the localization team with this information. This requires some more work sending the content for localization, but it will pay off later as a quality of in the quality of the translations you'll get back. All right, moving on to the next step, how, how you can set up your localization step of the flow. Uh, here, you, you will need to figure out whether you will use a translation management system. Uh, Translation management system is what transfixes do. And uh, an analogy I like to use here is that a translation memory management system, sorry, is like a, a content management system, like a WordPress, Sanity, Contentful. So the CMS, the content management system, uh, does not deliver the content itself, but you can use it to manage that content. In a similar way, uh, the translation management system works. So it's a place where you can see the progress of your content. You can include people to do their work. You can uh, discuss with people the progress and you can fetch content back to your application. Uh, a second decision uh, relates to whether you're using a translation vendor or not. Uh, we've covered uh, with Ryan some aspects of uh, translation vendors. So you need to choose based on uh, uh, your needs. And uh, some other aspects that you will need to check there are uh, if, you're, if you have uh, specific deadlines. Uh, what we have seen usually happen is uh, people uh, have an ETA, estimated time of, uh, I don't know, ETA, I don't recall the, what the A means, but uh, people have a, a time that they expect the content to be delivered by. So by the time they, they submit some content for translation, they expect it to be delivered within three days and something like that. Uh, figure out the priorities regarding the languages and the expected quality. Uh, are you using some uh, friendly tone of voice, some uh, professional tone of voice? And uh, finally, uh, how you communicate with the affected teams. If you're implementing something on your application, Will your development team need to know something to include in their deployment process involving localization? Uh, if you're implementing localization on your help center, will your support team need to know and take something into account regarding getting back the localized content and feeding it to, uh, to the help center? It's stuff like that that need an answer on your side. Uh, moving on to the last step on going public with your localized version. Uh, the first thing that uh, you will need to figure out is how you're gonna get the localized content back and how uh, will you make that available? So usually you start with manual downloads. 
you visit, uh, you get the file yourself and you, you will need to put it in the correct place to, to make it available. Uh, there are other ways that you can do that. Uh, so you can, for example, uh, automate this process and automatically get the content whenever it's ready. Uh, these steps involve this, this uh, handling, how you handle the localized content once it's back. Uh, moving on is the quality assurance to identify if there are any issues. Uh, so you need to have a, a place, a closed beta, something that is not publicly available to test the localized content and how that behaves on the application. Is it, work as, is it working as expected? Uh, what uh, did something break? Because uh, like uh, Ryan said, uh, the layout breaks or uh, you know, we missed uh, a numeric uh, value or a metric value. And if that goes well, then uh, you will uh, need to publish the translated content. Um, and past that, you need to monitor and repeat this process. Uh, what we add here is uh, in the in the parenthesis continuous localization is the most common case when you have a, a service that is updated uh, daily and changes over time. So you need to take that into account and figure out ways to make localization work for the continuous process and include that in your whole workflow. All right, we can move on to the next slide. Ryan. So about uh, monitoring progress, can we go to the next slide? What numbers on it? There we go. Okay, so basically you're gonna to wanna to look at reporting and monitor what's happening with your localization effort. Uh, for instance, to increase your conversion rate, you know, simply follow the money. Uh, and also you want to use that monitoring analytics to continually improve uh, your experience. So just some numbers quickly that we uh, found from Asana, 93,000 of their customers come from 190 countries and 42% of their revenue is non-US based. And looking at 2020 statistics from Doist and Todoist, uh, their international markets roughly mean 50% of their data. And according to Wishtrip, uh, Wishtrip achieved a 30% increase in lead conversion rate from their localized content. So you really wanna get some, some monitoring in place and, and see if it's effective and how you can keep uh, making it more effective. And there's a lot of information about how to do this reporting and monitoring. And uh, we don't have enough time to go into all of that now, but it's an important step that you want to look into carefully. Mike. All right. And uh, this is uh, after you've done all this work, uh, these are some indicators that showcase that your localization is scaling and it evolves. And uh, this will come uh, dynamically, this will, will come organically uh, as you work with localization. And we can proceed to the next slide to see what are the indicators uh, regarding this uh, growth. Uh, growth means that more content leads localization. The, so there are more departments that uh, enter localization and uh, want their content localized. Uh, with more content needs uh, needing localization, uh, automations are becoming a necessity. So you need to automate more work and uh, make your day-to-day -day, uh, easier to, to manage. Uh, again, going on with uh, point number three, uh, management scales as well, as you need uh, more people to work on content and there are more processes that you need to uh, sync with uh, departments and workflows. Uh, at this point, uh, it's a, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good place to be, to grow with localization. It, and it means that uh, there is value in investing more over there. And uh, in here, I would like to mention uh, some directions that uh, we uh, already offer in uh, Transfex to do that. And you can do that uh, with integrations. Uh, an example we've seen lately is that uh, people want to start localization early in the process. So they 
they start localization even from the designs. So you can use integrations like Figma and Sketch and involve even the designers in uh, the process of uh, localization. And you can expand, uh, like I said before, in uh, Zendesk or uh, Help Scout to localize your uh, support content as well. Uh, Brian, do you have anything to add here? Uh, I don't think you So I think we've covered everything we need to talk about at a basic level. All right. Um, so this is it uh, from us. Uh, thank you. And we can move on to some questions. Do we have any questions, Pam Pam? I'm COVID. <laughs> Let's see. So, so. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, Someone asked about machine translations combined with translation memory, and I see there's a response there. But yes, we, we, in our system, you can use both translation memory and machine memory. What usually happens is your translation memory kicks in first because you know those are already good quality translations. So anything it can fill in, it fills in, and then machine translation will take over and fill in anything that's not already done. I think that's fairly common. All right. So we have another there question. Also, again, about machine translation, this time only for marketing content. Any insights that we would like to share? Yeah, like I said before, like Ryan said before, and not all machine translation services are the same, are alike. So depending on uh, what... Uh, what uh, local markets you're targeting, you will, you will need to choose the, the machine translation service uh, accordingly. Um, for example, uh, DeepL is uh, a service that focuses on European languages. It's uh, trained over the EU corpus of public documents. So it tends to work better with uh, European languages. So you will need to, if we're talking about marketing, you will need to pay attention uh, on the machine translation service you use. Um, I think it's safer if you work with a vendor as well, uh, using the workflow, localization workflow we presented, where the translation vendor can edit the machine translated content to make it more sure that it's, it fits your needs. Looks like somebody asked, can someone work with file-based translations when there are no translation folders dedicated for language within a code repo of a website? Uh, usually languages or, or apps do have the ability to localize. This is fairly standard way of doing things, having localization files and resource folders and things like that. If for some reason you're doing everything from scratch and that doesn't exist, you, you would have to code something to implement this localization effort. But localization is fairly common. So I, I would bet that there's something already in place for that. Mike, do you have anything to add about that? Um, yeah, apart from what you said, Ryan, uh, there are tools that can counter that. Um, for example, we have a service called Transfix Live, which is essentially a JavaScript that you include in your website. And it works on top of your content, regardless uh, of any structure that it is out there. And uh, translations are happening uh, on the fly on your uh, website as the visitor visits the page and chooses another language. Um, and again, the file based yeah, usually has some kind of structure to support more than one languages. Yeah, the TransFX Live project is doing things over there, pushing and pulling strings over there. So it moves away from files to, to get away from things like that. Yeah. And then the second question, does the file based translation approach still need to pull the default language from a website into TransFX as a localization software tool? 
Well, well, you're going to pull in the default language in order to make the translations into all your other target languages. But usually, you know, that the default language is already exists on your site and your users are just switching to other target languages. And the default is to go back to the, the, the your source language. And usually I, I would like to add here that the, the source content, the source file, it's usually where all the metadata that the localization team can access uh, is on. So this act as a source of truth for the localization team to do their work. That's why it's needed on uh, a service like Transfix. See, so yeah, another question here. What are your thoughts on using machine translation for marketing content? I think we cover that. Yeah. For this, right, as a code sample here. Ryan, can you? I'm, I'm reading it now. I'm not sure that I'm following here. So a Android apps do, do have a way to localize their content that it's file based. I'm not sure what their question is actually. So let's move on to the next question. So a way to translate dynamic non predefined content retrieved from web services. Our, our TransFX live uh, project type uh, it can handle dynamic content, yes. So there's actually a checkbox where you, you can check to say, yes, handle dynamic content. And our JavaScript that needs to be injected on each page will crawl that, that new content that appears. And, and, and we do handle that. Yeah, also if uh, you're using uh, a modern way of localization with Transfix Native, Transfix Native essentially is an SDK that uh, right now supports uh, JavaScript, Android, uh, iOS, and Django, and uh, some more frameworks in uh, JavaScript, like uh, Angular and React, and we're now working on Node, then you can counter that dynamic content uh, using the SDK capabilities. So another question here, does TransFX support terminology definitions and terminology based suggestions to the translation vendor? So we do have something and most TMS systems have something called a glossary where you can refine terms and how you would like those to be specifically translated for each target language. So I think glossary is what we're talking about here, Mike. Do you have any other comments? Yeah, I believe it's, uh, it's glossary and uh, this is what uh, terminology is about. And you have, yeah, so we have a, a glossary and we can have what's called translation checks set up to ensure that uh, those words are specifically used instead of something else. All right. Uh, can a term bank be included in Transfix workflows? Um, glossary? Glossary, if we're talking about glossary, Glossary is available in all uh, workflows. Uh, and it's a matter of uh, adding your terms and uh, using uh, services uh, that we offer to make sure that those terms are correctly used. Hope this, yeah, glossary, all right. I think that's the end of the question, looks like. Yes. Hello to everyone. How easy is it to edit or change the source of existing keys? Um, so there's different file formats we support. Some are key based, some are non key value based. So it really kind of depends on the file format. And another way that supports that again is Transfix Native. Uh, and because of its nature, updating the content over the air, you have management of uh, the source content uh, in Transfix. Uh, this means that you don't need to uh, change anything in your code. 
you just change the source content in Transfix and the updates go live in your application. I think that's the end of the questions. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think we are uh, I, about to end this uh, event, this meeting. Thank you everyone for joining and it's been very interactive. So thank you for all these questions as well. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you again in the next one. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.